Welcome, Paul Fig, to Home is Where the Dark is. Paul, thanks for coming by. It's uh, It's been a little bit. Last time I saw you was at the awesome Dave's Room party that you threw, which was a lot of fun. So thank you for the invite. And uh, man, how's it been going? What's been up with you lately? Like, I know you've been posting new releases and you have a new project. So tell us a little bit about like what's been going on. Yeah, thanks, Alex, for having me. For uh, sure. Yeah, it's just been, you know, a wild ride. You got to keep all these balls rolling. Uh, actually, this Filth is Eternal record that just came out, uh, I recorded that a year ago. Oh. <laughs> so it was supposed to come out a little earlier than this. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, you know, finally the first single is coming out. So it's exciting for me because I get to, sh- you know, show off some new music. Absolutely. So you did a, a full length and then they came out with that single that you posted recently what was it called like crawl space crawl space yeah seattle band nice so you said you recorded about a year ago like from your experience like maybe in the last few years is it has it varied or have like a lot of artists you know you you finish the recording like up to mastering and then depending on what kind of campaign they choose like then the record comes out a year later or is it you know, some, I know some artists like to put stuff out like really quickly. So what's your been experience with that kind of like the timeline? Yeah, usually once the main mixes are delivered, it goes to mastering. And then maybe a month later, they'll start a campaign. So maybe they say three months or four months for a release. Yeah. This was just nothing for a while. Then, you know, oh, it's going to come out next year. Oh, yeah, summer next year. Oh, fall next year. And I'm like, all right. So this is the single and, you know, finally it's here. So were they just waiting for an opportune moment, like with some things to line up with press and PR and whatnot? Or was it, was there like, do you know the reason why they waited so long or? I, I don't, uh, but what I gather is Monarch Heavy or Monarch Music Group, uh, you know, they're their new signing and they were just getting their ducks in a row to gotcha. get everybody lined up. But everybody's super excited over there. And it's, I mean, they're getting a nice push and I think they deserve it. You've been working over at, you know, you had Dave's room for a bit. And um, I know you've you've had a lot of artists come through there and you brought a lot of your own artists in there. So what's been, um, what's been like the general kind of genres that you've been working on at Dave's room? Because I know it, it seems to appeal to a lot of like rock artists and um the room obviously is like is catered for that kind of a sound but what's what's been like your experience so far um because i know you've been working there for a while but what's been like the genres that you've been working on there for me uh it it varies so you know from jerry cantrell to this band the lost chorus which is a little bit more synth-based alternative music uh but yeah i like to bring in the heavier stuff Right now, my partner David Sprang, he's great. Uh, him and Shooter Jennings come in, and they always they're bringing in Americana and kind of country esque bands, and you know they're just they're knocking them out of the park. They're <clears throat> they're crushing. So when I can get in there, I try to bring in uh, you know some grungier or you know rocking or more heavy things. I actually got Chad Bamford to come down, and he did the off record there with Keith Morris and uh, Dimitri Coates, and uh, that was super fun. Nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've never, um, I don't think I met, I haven't met David yet, but I noticed um, they did, he and Shooter Jennings did the the latest Manson record. That's been out for a couple of years now, but mm-hmm. I saw that you, you guys did some overdubs there for that. Yeah. Which I was like, shit, that's awesome. Because like, I'm such a huge Manson <laughs> fan. And um, yeah. yeah, I just, I love that sound and that aesthetic. So it was cool to hear that you guys did that over there. Yeah. Right on, man. So you also have, um, you're involved in a new music project called Lewis, correct? Yes. And uh, what's uh, what's going on with that? Can tell us a little bit about that sound and um, like the goal for that. Okay, so Lewis, uh, we'll just back up. I did a record for the singer of the Kinnison uh, a few years back, and it was fun. He came in with like 30 songs. Everybody, like, you know, I put a drummer in t- together with him, and he brought in a bass player. They learned the music on the floor. Very simple, just kind of raw, kind of, you know, edgy rock. And, uh, you know, uh, it was live, no click. And, you know, it was fun. But uh, after the record was done and he released it, he couldn't find a guitar player to join the band to do shows. So 
I picked up a guitar. I'm like, you know, I'll do it. And I picked up a guitar and I started learning the songs. And I'm like, Chris, this song is like physically uncomfortable to strum. And he's not a guitar player. He plays guitar and he writes like he's prolific. He just keeps writing and writing and writing. So uh, at this point, I'm looking at a folder he's, you know, compiling for me. And there's, you know, 30, 40 tunes in it. So I'm like, I'm going to be the guitar presence on your next record. I'm just, I'm going to take care of all the electrics. Don't worry. Nice. And so, <clears throat> and I wanted this record to be like leaps and bounds from the last. So I just, you know, took my time and created this lush kind of thing to go with his like, you know, kind of fragile and vulnerable vocals. And uh, I think we, you know, we did a good job creating a, a really solid record. Hell yeah. Mm-hmm. So what's the plan for the rest of this year? Are you guys going to get some shows lined up or do you have some lined up already? Or are you just going to record some more tracks? Like what's the plan for that? Uh, well, we have a whole record done. So right now it's just get the live show together, start playing, start making friends with other bands and getting on shows and, uh, you know, get this thing off the ground. Right on. Mm-hmm. And then you also mentioned before we started recording that you're going to be going out with uh, Belinda. So I think you mentioned that to me too before that you, uh, you know, you'd toured with her before and mm-hmm. done sessions with her before. So tell us a little bit about that. Okay. So in this world that we're in, engineering and producing, uh, for me, I would love to work in the studio every day. It's just not the case. Rock bands in our genres just don't have the the budget to keep us busy. So I have to diversify. Whether I'm creating music for TV and film or I have friends that are all in the Belinda Carlisle band, they're like, hey, we need someone to like wrangle our back line. It's a super easy job. I'm like, I'll do that. And it takes the pressure off of me because I don't have to, I'm not on the hustle. I just show up, plug a couple guitars in, tune a bass, tune a guitar, set up a keyboard and I'm done. I just make sure nothing's falling apart or catching on fire and I yeah. get paid. It's <laughs> it's you know super fun and I get to travel and you know uh we're staying in the same hotels as Belinda and she's like one of the coolest and uh and it's a super fun show. So yeah, you mentioned about like you know not having to be on the hustle and I think it's uh you know most engineers and producers like unless you're on that really top tier level where you're just flooded and inundated with work and you're booked like years in advance unless you're at that level like yeah you we do have to um not only are we having to do our job as an engineer producer mixer and get better at our craft we also like i would say more than 50 percent of the job is finding the work right absolutely like our job is to find the next job yeah i don't think a lot of people realize that i think um, you know, people that aren't maybe in the industry or they, they see it from the outside, they think, oh, you just, just comes to you. Like you just do your thing. And it's like, actually, you know, the, the longer I've been doing this, the more I realize, damn, like this is just never going to end. Like, unless until you, you know, you get a huge break or something awesome, magical happens mm-hmm. where you just get a, a huge hit and then you're, maybe you don't have to hustle as much, but True. I, I was just like, it's just, I just kind of realized and accepted that, you know, doing this is not only about what you're actually doing. It's about, you know, putting, um, you know, developing your name, getting yourself out there. And just because you did a bunch of records last year doesn't mean you're going to do a bunch the next year just, mm-hmm. just from like the work, like speaking for itself. Right. Yeah. So you have to constantly network, you know, go out to shows, talk to people, Put yourself mm-hmm. in front of new new bands, new musicians. So, yeah, I think when when you said that, that really resonated with me, is because it's like, dude, it's such a, it's such a grind. Yeah. And um, you know, it's uh, I mean, I know legends out there that just aren't working, and or aren't working like they should be. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it seems like a lot of the music out there that does generate money are artists or pop artists that don't really need studios either. Mm. You know, it's either laptop productions or majority laptop productions. Yeah. Then they bring that in the studio and they, you know, they're going to put that together and get it done pretty quick. Yeah. Pretty super efficient. But it's not miking a kick drum and, 
you know, sitting in a, in a room with a band for a month and making sure everything is right and shaping a sound. I have a question for you regard with what you just said. Yeah. So what would you find it, what would you find to be like the biggest challenge for you at this point in your career, like with the, the engineering and producing and mixing, like, is it, is it in fact that like continuing to um, to keep the work coming in? What would be the biggest challenge for you? Well, this is what I'm discovering. And, you know, I've got amazing credits. I worked with Nick Rasculinix straight out of Sound City and he kept me busy. But after a while, you start to realize nobody really cares who engineers the record. You're never in the press. Nobody cares. They want to know who the producer is. And, and then that's even a tough one because as soon as uh, somebody drops a single, the press is like, oh, this person directed the video. Right. Well, they wouldn't have a video unless somebody produced a great sounding track. Yeah. So uh, that was, that's kind of like my main shift right now is to not engineer so much and to produce more. And I'll produce anything I produce, I engineer and mix unless they have more budget and they want to go with somebody else to mix, yeah. which is great. Uh, but I, I love it. I love, you know, from getting a, a demo all the way down to the final mix and delivering it and hearing the master and signing off on that. Yeah, it's exciting. That part's exciting. It's so true because like a lot of, you know, most of the clients we work with, they, they put out a record and single, but they also, in this day and age, you have to put out of, well, you don't have to, but it's a, it's often like you really should put out a music video for at least a few songs on your record just to get eyes on it because everything is visual these days with like Instagram, Facebook, everything is like if the song mm -hmm. doesn't have a video, then it's probably not going to be heard as much. Yeah. So, but also I noticed like in the credits of these music videos, it's very rarely like do they mention who engineered it or produced it or mixed it or mastered it. And or even where was it recorded. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, you go to the say like someone hears uh, whoever's song and they're like, "Wow, I love how this sounds!" Like, I wanna, I wanna figure out who who did this. But then, you know, you go to the the YouTube description and it's not there, or you go to Spotify credits and it's not there, or wherever, and it's like it, it's very fresh, frustrating, and it's still something like we we have to deal with. And um, yeah, I it, often have to like, sorry to cut you off, I have to fight to like. I have to constantly remind clients be like, Hey, could you add the credit or Hey, could you add the credit? And sometimes it takes multiple times. It's super important. And my manager makes sure that's in the language. The credits have to be there. Yeah. And, but you know, they're, you know, when you go to Spotify, you can't control how that metadata is put in. True. Sometimes it's just, the artist and you don't know anything else about the record so then you go searching on the internet and you have to go to all music which is just inundated with ads now like yeah. you it's so difficult to scrub through and trying to figure out who did what on what record uh actually discogs has been doing a better job like they'll I like, that like one better they'll yeah. actually list where it was recorded and when and what's cool about that is you can go in I don't, I don't know if you can with all music. With Discogs, you can go in and like edit stuff yourself too. Oh, you can, wow. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've never really, I've never really liked uh, all music because it just seems so messy and like it's not very streamlined and it's kind of like they don't have, everything isn't up there and some things are there that shouldn't be there and it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. But um, It used to be the industry standard. I, I knew some A&R people and this is where they would go, hey, we really like that record. Who did that? And they would go to all music. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, I'm like, oh, wow, cool. I need to get on there. I need to make sure I have credits. So, you know, all the way from Sound City assistant engineering credits to all the engineering credits and the production credits. And, it, you know, it, it adds up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I don't know if it's still like this, but with all music, there was a point where you could only have a credit on there if it was like a physical if it was printed as like a physical CD or a physical copy, mm. I think that might have changed now because every, everything's streaming. Mm -hmm. But um, I really think there should be something. I know there's a company called, there's an app called Muso.ai. Have you heard of that one? Mm -mm. But that's another app that is, I believe Jay Baumgartner created it. Okay. And it's like a, um, a credits app. And uh, I I tried it like when it first started, but I hadn't, haven't followed up with it. But 
Um, I know a lot of people are on there, but I think there needs to be a more like, you know, universal standard for credits that should be like incorporated with the streaming services because it's really, it's just so fragmented. Like Spotify, um, when you go to the credits, there isn't, there isn't, it's only like artist, producer, and I think um, writer. Those are the three mm-hmm. options. And unless you're a label or you're really, really savvy with your distributors, like if you're using a CD Baby, TuneCore, C- um, I use DistroKid, like there's mm-hmm. sections where you can go in and you can add very, very specific credits through that. But And you can deliver that to the stores, but that doesn't mean that they're going to um, upload properly. But mm-hmm. with Spotify, I've noticed they only add, there's only room for producer which mm-hmm. I guess is better than nothing. But yeah, so if someone wants to know who makes this yeah. and they go to it and it's just it just shows the artist and the producer. Um, but with title, it's a lot better because title, they show way more um, detail, like the engineer, mm-hmm. the assistant, the like everything is available on title. I don't know about the other if ones. If the artist if puts they it just, in there. Right, yeah. right. And so yeah, just trying to iron out the inconsistencies and making sure everyone's doing the same thing. I mean- are you going to release a piece of vinyl and not mention who produced the record, who engineered it, when it was when it was recorded, and where was it? It was recorded. Yeah, that seems insane to me. No, it you, is. It is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like I remember before um, Napster and like when everyone was still buying CDs. Like that was one of the first things I would do is look at okay, who wrote the songs, who produced it. Mm-hmm. Like I was really excited about that and like looking at the artwork and opening it up. It just seems like no one cares anymore about, well, I mean, we do, but like the average yeah. listener, consumer, it's just like, is it on Spotify? If not, then I guess it doesn't exist or yeah. whatever. Cause like it's either on Spotify or YouTube. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, like what are you, um, what do you feel like about, how do you feel about the new technology? Like the AI with music and all this new crap that is like being pushed in our faces, like, is there like are you worried about the future of like music for like music creators or how do you feel about that? Well, yeah, I, I do have feelings about this. I'm not sure, and I haven't seen the capabilities of AI. Can they create someone playing an acoustic guitar? Probably not yet, but I know can they, they can. Create, they can uh, create like um, they sampled like like my my buddies over down across the way mm-hmm. um shelby and he's a producer and they're called the fund but they did a single with um grimes but mm-hmm. ai grimes because like you i guess you can i don't know how it works but they they generated a um, vocal from grimes wow yeah mm-hmm. and so that's a thing already i don't yeah. know about like render me uh like spit or you, you can type a prompt and it like spits out um an acoustic stereo guitar guitar track in c or something like it mm. with at the, with x bpm i don't know if i mean it'll probably get to that point but yeah it's like i think it just depends on what the client wants you know because I, I feel like hopefully still people would prefer um an actual musician but yeah we'll see i mean you know if you're creating product and you're just out there to make money, which by the way, I'm sure you know, this isn't extremely lucrative. It's like you have to love this and and get into a room with musicians and iron their music out and make sure they're playing in tune and in time and yeah. you know their vocals make sense and they're not getting cliche or too wild. Um, you know, that's, that's the whole art. Uh, you take that all away and is that interesting? Yeah, to me, I'm obviously since this is what we do, so I'm I'm obviously like right away I'm very resistant to it, but yeah. I can see how I can see how like some people might enjoy it because it's something like if they want a quick idea um, with this style of vocal, like there was already um, there was like Drake some Drake singles that came out mm-hmm. that were all AI that the label yeah. was like creating or something like that, but I don't know. I could see how if you want like a quick idea just to get something started and you don't have, you can't go into a studio with your favorite mm-hmm. artist, you could be like, just 
uh, spit out a Drake vocal yeah. in this key and to get me started. But yeah, I'm I'm obviously would I'm never gonna be like into that because I value what we do, obviously. Yeah. No, absolutely. But, I just don't understand how I mean, when I work with a vocalist, that person's singing from experience and emotion. Yeah. And pulling words out and delivering them in a way where he's at right then and trying to convey something. Um, I'm not sure if, I mean, can, I haven't heard the AI do anything like this yet. Yeah. And that would be concerning because if it can mimic that, then how do we know, you know, where to draw the line? Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's getting really scary because it's not only like with music, but obviously like, um, I got into the, I tried out the mid journey thing for a bit, like the generated images from a prompt. Mm -hmm. I just, I was curious. Um, and it's like, it's extremely, it's just getting better and better. And I don't know, it's, it's scary because like, who knows, who knows where like our civilization is going to be in the next five years. It's because it's just going, it's advancing at such a fast pace. Yeah. So it's like, shit. But, you know, so there go the, you know, graphic designers are already sweating. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, they make a lot of money. If they're really good at what they do, they they make, you know, they can make a living. Yeah. But then all of a sudden, are you a graphic designer? If you can open up your laptop and say to this program, hey, this is what I need. Perfect. And then charge. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's silly. But that's, that's what you said. That's literally all it takes. Like yeah. you go on a, with Mid Journey, you just, you get download discord you pay the mm-hmm. subscription and you just type a prompt out and it spits mm-hmm. it out in 30 seconds and it's it'll create variations you can upscale it and i was wow. like wow but yeah i don't know uh, the future is scary but yeah <laughs> we'll see i'm just trying to like you know keep doing my thing keep making music keep uh trying to work with great artists and mm-hmm. hopefully you know that will be yeah, something we can you, continue to do yeah <laughs> so i mean like what would ai create uh a band like the gorillas and then you go and watch a screen yeah mm-hmm. that's that's not very exciting i, agree. I like the gorillas but there's a, there's people behind the screen and you can see them yeah but, there was i can't remember who put out this article but it was something exactly like what you just said like ai created music and created AI created artists and it was like the show was like um, a hologram or like a projection and mm. it was just like that's that's the show it was just yeah. generated AI, AI artists and it's like well I guess I could see how maybe some people would like that but I think there needs to be like some kind of regulation you know because you know I've been wa- watching a lot of interviews with Elon Musk and he's talking mm-hmm. about like um AI in the workplace with like robots and all mm-hmm. that. And it seems like even he's like, even he's scared of, of the future of it. And it's like you, there needs to be some kind of regulation or it could get really out of hand in all. Yeah. In I mean, but aspects. isn't this the point with AI is to, let's just cut to the chase. AI make us money, period. That's all they care about. Oh yeah. yeah. I, I mean like, Hey, I can get this computer to do all these things. That's fascinating, but ultimately, at the end of the day, it's for what? Money. It's always about money, right? Yeah. Yeah. So just, hey, leave everybody out of it. Just tell them to generate money. Yeah. (laughs) Just curious about, you know, you've been doing this for a long time, and Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot, there's still a lot of up-and-coming engineers and producers and mixers who... uh, maybe they're just getting started or they've been in, they've been going at it for a few years or they're like, you know, deeper into their career, but what would be some advice you you could give to people who are maybe struggling or just trying to, you know, to level up um, just, just from your experience. Cause I know you've, you've been doing it for a while and you've worked with great Mm -hmm. artists, but what's like, what's some good advice you could give to, uh, to our listeners? Um, Well, I'm, I was extremely lucky to have come up an amazing studio and work in amazing studios. And I think if you don't get that foundation, you don't understand like a like a, a workflow and a troubleshooting you know tool like just having that those tools to troubleshoot. Uh, um, if you're really relaxed and it's just only in your bedroom or your your garage turned into a, a space, you don't understand like where I'm coming from 
or why the cue system needs to be a certain way. Um, you're not just spitting it out of yeah. one and two. Um, but uh, I think that would help. I always tell, uh, I you know, I give tours at the studio and I meet with young engineers and like, you know, if you can get a job at, you know, Henson or any village, east, west, you know, these big places, intern there, be a runner, you know, if you kick ass, uh, hopefully they put you in a room and you're an assistant engineer and you can start learning and see how all these other people work. Because mm-hmm. I wouldn't have the tools I have if I didn't see Barisi and, you know, Matt Hyde and Jim Scott and Bianco and all these great people and Dave Sardi come through the studio. I just wouldn't. Right. I would have my version of what I think. And then scrubbing through YouTube and there's a lot of people with a lot of opinions. Yeah. I've seen some goofy <laughs> things, but it's, you know, being in the studio, hey, I like that. I'm going to I'm going to remember that. Oh, that I'm not into that. I can okay, I see what's going on here, but also when you're an assistant, you get to document you know, hopefully your uh, engineer and producer want actual documentation of the setup. Mhm. And you're paying attention to all the EQ settings, the mic pre settings, the fader settings, your high pass filters, your low pass filters, whatever you're using to record. And then after a while, you start to look at your 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 documentation. You're like, hey, this is this makes sense. I see what these guys are doing. But if you don't do that, you know, uh, I did a session where the kid just wanted to take pictures. The artist or the engineer or the the in, the the assistant engineer. Oh, and I was, uh, you know, I was a little bummed out at that because now I've got to scrub through and try to find the picture for this one song. For you know, I'm scrolling through hundreds of pictures trying to find this one song for the one guitar part or whatever this bass chain was to get back to it. Gotcha. Yeah. And but did this kid memorize what was going on? No, he just took the picture and went back to his phone and went scrolling through whatever he was scrolling through. He was like on his phone during the session, like just looking at yeah Facebook or whatever. Damn. Yeah. That's a no, no. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big thing too, is just, you know, etiquette in the studio and like reading the room and, you know, mm-hmm. cause some artists are very, very lenient. Some producers are more lenient, but mm-hmm. it's just all about like, you know, like reading the room and, and knowing up front, like what the artist or the yeah. producer expects. And, um, you know, I had a similar, I had a similar situation a few times, like at various studios where it's like, sometimes there'll be a new intern that you're not mm-hmm. expecting to be there just because the yeah. studio goes through them quickly or whatever. And, um, you know, there's, there's been times where I've had to be like, um, to go to like the studio manager, be like, Hey, can we, uh, can we get rid of these interns? Cause some of sometimes they're just, they're too, they think they're, they need to do more than they should instead of just like sitting back and just observing. They're like mm-hmm. making comments about stuff and like asking too many questions, which I'm cool. Like questions are cool, but not when I'm like in, in the zone with an artist, you yeah. know, trying to focus. Mm-hmm. No, absolutely. It's so it's totally distracting. And then, you know, sometimes if they just aren't reading the room and they don't understand like that, you know, you shouldn't do that in certain moments. Um, yeah. yeah. It, you know, I was lucky again at Sound City. I mean, we had to, we were trained. It, there was this great book, The Assistant Engineer's Handbook. And it was just like the Xerox copied thing just that was at the runner desk. And you read that back and forth. It was really short read, you know, before you became an assistant. Yeah. So when you're an assistant, you know, you keep your mouth shut. Unless somebody asks you, your comment doesn't need to be heard right uh you know and and then the other thing is to always like be two steps ahead of where the the producer and the engineer are going like you have to pay attention and and like you're saying read the room hey if they're discussing during a take hey you know what maybe we should have like that you know this other piece of gear or this pedal or this whatever uh you know maybe we should you know and so you're like okay so hey there's a little tiny break you make sure that stuff's at like in your hands yeah. or Already on the patched. cart yeah. or ready to be patched yeah. and you're 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 paying attention and it seems like you know hey fig can we and it's like I'm already on it here you go you're done yeah thanks we're rolling it makes such a difference yeah. like i think you know i've talked with other 
engineers about this. Like, you know, it seems like the assistant engineer position is can most of the time it's more stressful and more difficult than the actual producer's position or engineers. Cause you have to be like on the same level and then three steps ahead and like reading the room being like having, doing everything for everybody. Like it's, it's very, uh, it's very stressful. But when I was at sunset of sound a couple of times this year, uh, I worked with this one guy and, you know, I was a little nervous because it's a new space. I don't know like how the assistant's going to be. Mm-hmm. Cause it's like, I don't know the signal flow here. Like hopefully mm-hmm. it goes smoothly. And I was just blown away by, this dude because he was just like two steps ahead of me had everything ready just Mm -hmm. like i was like damn this is awesome i can just focus on what i'm doing and i don't have to worry about if this you know something is patched wrong or if there's a bad patch or like everything just went so perfectly i was like damn this is this is what i'm talking about and but that's you know i mean it's sunset sound you you expect nothing less yeah yeah. still it's like you know there's just because there's been so many situations i've I've worked in one. It hasn't been that way. And I was like, mm-hmm. okay, this is, this is what it's all about. Yeah. So I had a friend, he was, you know, he calls me up. It's like, Fig, I'm, you know, I'm going to do a session at village. And I've never worked on a large format console. And I was like, all right, well relax. You're going to have an assistant. Yeah. So just tell him what you want. Give him an input sheet and tell him what you want. You want this kick drum with this mic, uh, with this EQ, with this compressor. And that's going to go where? Yep. You just give them all that information and it'll be done. Yeah. And then you just push the faders up and make sure you're hearing what you need to hear. Yeah. And, and he was so thankful. And I was just like, you know, Hey, you know, that's cause he's never been in that situation. He's one of these you know indie guys that, you know, does it from his house or his garage or whoever's garage or mm-hmm. these little tiny studios around town and uh, you know, where everything's modular. Yeah. So when he's on a big giant desk and you know, like an 88 R <clears throat> that can be very intimidating. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it was cool too, because like I was expecting, because all the sessions I do, I'm I'm always running Pro Tools at the same time. If there's a console, I'm like doing both. But uh, mm-hmm. the assistant was like, yeah, I could just run t- tools for you too. I'm like, Jesus Christ, like this is awesome. Because I'm just, I'm used to doing everything all yeah. the time. You mm-hmm. know? And just being in an environment where they're like so pro and they're so like, accommodating where it's yeah. just like this is fucking cool but yeah i mean it takes it takes a lot of years to get to a certain point like that where you know you've been in all these stressful sessions you've worked with mm-hmm. you worked with some of the greats you've been put through different situations so i mean i think it's like you either you're either the kind of person that gets it and just knows when to knows when to be quiet and knows when to like intervene if mm-hmm. you need to. And like, it's just, I think you ever, you either have it or you don't in those situations. Yeah. You yeah. can, it can be learned, but I think, um, yeah, it's just, well, there's a drive yeah, and, and a work ethic that needs to be like that bar needs to be high. If you don't have that and you're like, I've got a job, I'm making, you know, blankety blank, you know, an hour and I'm stoked. I'm the assistant here. I mean, I was at this one studio where I'm like, where's my assistant? And there's a, you know, number on the chalkboard. And I'm like, where, you know, Hey, can we get this? And I had to chase this guy down. It's like, that took me out of what I was trying to do. Of course. Yeah. Um, But you know, like when you were saying like, you know, when you're producing and engineering, you're on the desk and you're running pro tools, I would love to have a budget where, Hey, you, you concentrate on that. I'm going to concentrate on the music. Yeah. And I'm lucky I get to work with Jim Scott and he hires me to run this side of the desk while he's he's making a chart and a map of every take and you know in three or four takes he's like hey i think i got something we can put together and he just hands me a sheet i comp it up boom and it sounds like one glorious flawless you know not flawless but you know great take and it feels it feels awesome hell yeah you know so uh yeah i would love that but yeah i'm with you i have to i'm running tools i'm trying to pay attention i'm keeping notes i'm flying the rig i'm moving the you know stuff around mm-hmm. yeah but yeah dude like you know we we're usually with like with the budgets with a lot of the artists like yeah we we have to do it all so like when you when we do get in those situations where like we can just sit at the desk and just listen listen and ride the fader push faders up and just mm-hmm. really be in the moment and focus on the the sonics like i was just like oh my god this is 
this is amazing. Cause like mm-hmm. 99% of the time, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm in here at a few other studios and it's like, yeah, I'm having to do both. And it's, mm-hmm. I, I love that too. But when you can just kind of, you can, you know, that someone else is taking care of that yeah, pro tools or whatever. And like, you can just sit there and actually be more present in the listening and mm-hmm. the, you know, producing the artists and like, giving your ideas to the artists and uh, guiding the artists. Yeah. And because just, be, being able like to focus a, on the performance, mm-hmm. that is a job in itself and making sure, you know, Hey, what are you trying to convey? Are you pushing too hard? You, you lean back too hard. Is this vocal happening? Is the guitar player just, you know, digging in too much or not enough? Is the bass player pulling, you know, and going sharp, all those things. And, you know, if you're not paying attention, they just, all right, this is close enough, but, you know, you want to get better. You want to push right. the bar higher. You want to be, you, you want to make sure that's great. Right. Cause they, if you're, if you're running tools and on the console mm-hmm. and like you're focused on like getting the playlist right and punching them in. Right. And then maybe you, you miss something that you wouldn't have missed if you were just laser focused mm-hmm. on listening instead yep. of the screen. Like, yeah, major, but yeah. you know, you, you've been at sound city, you've been at Dave's room. Like what are some of your, you know, what are some of your favorite spots like in LA that you've, engineered at or produced at that like really love the the workflow and the sound of the rooms well uh you know besides sound city i can't get in there the next best place is where the desk went and that's where i tracked uh the drums for filth is eternal and yeah. i was just like man and uh, you know it's like it's like coming home you know and it's a great room and the control room is you know the response is pretty flat and it just sounds awesome and uh, there are those Allen sides mains that, you know, you just crank and it's like you're inside the drum kit. It's nice. just sounds ridiculous. But, uh, it, you know, I've, I've done a bunch of records there and it's a great space. Um, you know, Trivium, uh, not Trivium, Shadows Fall, Death Angel. Uh, I tracked Anoop Sastry with Marty Friedman there. Nice. And that was just, you know, what a crusher that guy is. And then... Uh, and then Filth is Eternal. Um, actually, I did Fuzz Evil there, too. That was super fun. We just tracked live, like in two days, brought it back to Dave's room, knocked it out. Nice. Mm-hmm. How is the is the console still in really good condition? The last time I was in there, yeah. it was in the best condition I'd ever heard it in. Hell yeah. Like, every bus worked, every ox end worked. Like, nothing was, you know, acting up. I was like, all right. Nice. Yeah. I'd love to get in there one of these days, because, like, yeah, I've never seen or used uh, that classic console ever, mm-hmm. but you know, I've heard all the. It is a tank. Yeah, I bet when it works, yeah. it's a tank. Hell yeah. yeah! Were you able to um, to chat with Dave at all over there? At like, no, no, this was uh, this was last year, and I'd booked the, the time well in advance, and then Taylor passed away, mm. and. You know, I called the band. I'm like, hey, everybody, um, be prepared to shift gears. We might not be able to get in. And, but, you know, through their grieving and, you know, you know, we were already booked and I'm, you know, dialed in with those guys. Uh, <clears throat> you know, they they let us use the Vista Light kit that we asked for, which was Taylor's. And uh, they had no problem with us being there. And, you know, we just kept to ourselves. We highly respected the place and, you know, weren't social mediaing all over the, all over it. We were just kind of kept to ourselves and just focused because we had four days to get, how many songs? It was, like, it was a lot of songs, but they're short. I think their longest song was three minutes. But, you know, it's a lot of takes. It's a lot of drum hits. And we had to edit some of that stuff. So, you know, we, we just focused, got that stuff. Broke it down, headed over to Dave's room, and did all the guitars and bass. Hell yeah! Mm-hmm. So when you're doing like these more extreme like metal productions, do you prefer like I know you mentioned earlier like you enjoy when you know if you engineer and produce a record, you enjoy when you can send it to a, an outside mixer. But um, since you know budgets are smaller, um, mm-hmm. you know we find ourselves having to do everything most of the time. Yes. Um, so how do you like? Uh, the process of mixing compared compared to producing like is there something that you favor or do you like all of it or is there something that you're more into no i like all of it but if i'm gonna if somehow we're in a rush and i don't get all the drum takes i need 
and that just kind of paints me in a corner. Then I'm like, eh, you know, so then I kind of have to wrench in a little bit. Um, I don't lean on samples. I try not to. I try not to use any samples. So uh, I want the drummer to be fully represented. Like, this is his performance. This is how they're hitting. As hard or soft as they're hitting. And this is it. This is them pushing and pulling on the band. Um, yeah, there's going to be edits. But um, but samples, I'm like, hey, I want I want this thing to be a little bit more human. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always been like... I've always been about whatever sounds the best. So if it, that means using a sample, if that means not using a sample, mm -hmm. if that means editing, not editing, yeah. I don't care. As long mm -hmm. as it's, as long as we're getting the result we want coming yeah. out of the speakers, I don't care what's done in the yeah. box or on the console. What I have noticed lately is what I, I've really been enjoying. Um, and I've, I've done this at most of the drum tracking sessions I've done since I started, but I usually never used them. Like I would, after every uh, single or album, after mm -hmm. we're done tracking the drums, just get drum samples of the kit. Oh yeah. And then most of the time I just end up using a different sample from a different kit if we're using samples. But mm -hmm. lately I've been doing this thing where um, I'll maybe do, I'll take like three or four different velocities of the snare, three or four different velocities of the kick of the, of their kit and then if I decide to sample that song, I'll use the samples from the kit and then blend them with the with the raw performance. And yeah. it seems to be, it seems to be, it, it's like has the impact of a sample, but it doesn't sound like a different drum or a different mm -hmm. kit, which is really fun to do. Yeah. And um, I found there's this newer thing I like to do where since when you're capturing samples of the kit, you're capturing it in all of the microphones, obviously. So mm -hmm. um, I like to do like, I call it like my my kick and snare like spread mm -hmm. stereo track where I'll take the sample of the kick but only use the stereo room file and throw that underneath the kick mm. drum and just kind of use it in in parallel with the room track of the whole kit but I'll I'll throw like um just a stereo track of the kick in the room okay and then blend yeah. that under the kick if if it's if it's more like open like doom metal track where yeah. there's like a lot of space in between the kicks and, and snares, then it, it like you feel the impact of the kick in the center and then you, you feel it spread mm -hmm. across like in the stereo field, which is something I've been experimenting with a little bit more. And same thing with the snare. Like yeah. I'll put a stereo snare sample, but of just the room mic mm -hmm. on top of the sample and then on top of the normal snare and yeah. just kind of fuck with that. And that's been a lot of fun. And it just, it's, it sounds, it sounds more natural, um, but it still has that feeling of more transient from yeah. the sample. I had okay. the opposite experience with this band Cemetery, and this great band, Death Metal from Germany, uh, sent me these tracks, and the drums were on a V-kit, mm. but it was so isolated and so drum machine. I, was, I needed to inject life into it, so I took the, you know, every kick you know ran it through a speaker through a kick drum and mic the kick drum in the room just so i can get some like different types of decays natural decays because it was so sterile yeah and i did the same thing with the snare and then it then it actually like i was like okay i can live with this this is this doesn't sound so f fake to me yeah that sounds like i love doing stuff like that mm -hmm. man just like creating uh, creating room sounds from like just uh, like a V drum kit, like mm -hmm. like all those samples in those um, modules, like you mm -hmm. said, they're most of them are very, very dry and kind of sterile. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, just like using fun, unique uh, sonic tricks to yeah. to get like a, a different sounding, like just create a room tone out of to, room tone out of nothing is just so much fun. Just yeah. with, however you can with like you know parallel compression or like serial compression and just doing weird shit to create a space is like, mm -hmm. that's so much fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, these drum samples, I mean, BFD, you know, they're BFD or superior drummer. They're all getting really good. Yeah. Yeah. But the symbols just, I'm not down with yet. Yeah. Um, but you know, at the same time, I'm like listening to a track. Uh, somebody was like, you know, Hey, can you, can you match the vibe of this track? And I was listening to it and I'm like, I'm like, oh, those drums are pretty good. And I started really paying attention. I'm like, these are programmed. 
Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'll get there. Yeah. yeah. Actually, like the AFI record, you know, Jade programmed all the drums. And so I have Adam Carson's like, well, you know, we need to beat these drum sounds. I'm like, all right. So we take our time and we get there. We inch, inch, inch closer and closer. And it's like, boom, we did it. And then he's actually playing real drums that are crushing the program drums. And I love that. Since I do a lot of like technical metal where the drums are very busy, Mm -hmm. there's something I really like about program drums, especially with the more modern... um, software like i like the slate stuff mm-hmm. like the ssd5 i really like the room tracks that they provide in their mixer like are pretty good and then you can enhance them more and and create create more from there but mm-hmm. um i've often find that if the drummer of the uh the record isn't as tight it's often like it takes less time to just re just program the drums than to edit them because mm. if there's like really intense blast beats or like really fast like 30 second note kicks that mm-hmm. are really sloppy um trying to edit that like is just a nightmare so i find like sometimes i've just reprogrammed drums to certain songs like and it sounds way better just because it's or maybe i'll still yeah. use the symbols mm-hmm. from the the natural kit but yeah. i mean i don't know any real drummer maybe adrian from the haunted he might be able to really do a nice blast really even Mm -hmm. and you know consistent volume but other than that it's like you're gonna hear that thing wavering i remember listening to slayer early on and you can hear his you know he's lombardo's going up and down with the timing and you can hear the intensities going back and forth but that was like the cool thing about it It oh yeah that's a human being like he's struggling he's at the edge of his ability just pushing that thing and that's exciting yeah you know yeah it is, and uh, I love records like that where they leave they completely leave the the human aspect uh, in there, and mm-hmm. there's no click, um, and they're just kind of like barely on the edge of not being able to get the part. Yeah, but, but you, it, I, this is in the tape days. Yeah, especially with metal drums are like for me, it's the most challenging part of the record um, to to get it right and to to have it not not sound too uh, too edited, but not sound too. Uh, too sloppy so like finding mm-hmm. that middle ground yeah. is the challenge so yeah you've done a lot of rock and metal but are there any like other genres that you that you kind of would like to explore more of or are you happy like in the in the well, genres you're doing you know i'd like to do a lot more indie alternative stuff uh, there's some like dark wave stuff i'm like wow that's fantastic why is yeah. this all over the place and uh, I don't know if they're just programming that stuff or they just have like two mics in a garage. They just do it themselves. But I'm like, this is cool. Um, I uh, I record a buddy of mine. He's in a band called The Lost Weekend. And it's super like, you know, countryfied stones. And it's kind of a giant thing right now. All this like Americana and like country music. And uh and I had a blast tracking him, and, and he's always fun. He's super talented, and he's, he's always got these amazing players. And uh, that's cool, too. I don't get a lot of calls for that, just him, but I'm hoping I get more. So do you think... Um, Especially for live tracking. Yeah, I think like we kind of find, like for me, it's like we get calls for a certain thing, and sometimes mm-hmm. it kind of... It just happens it's like it just happens without us like really trying like for some reason um like i've never advertised until like a couple years ago but i've never advertised like that i'm a mastering engineer but for some reason like maybe like people have called me and and asked me to master their stuff because i i did like a couple records that um out of nowhere like well Mm -hmm. there's no budget for mastering so master it so i mastered it and then i started getting hit up for mastering like i've never said i'm mastering engineer yeah but sometimes Mm -hmm. sometimes you just like find like people people see something different in you that maybe you're not picking up on or you're not like putting out there but people see that Mm -hmm. so then they they come to you for that so like what have you like you said you you're not you're not getting calls for that kind of stuff but are there things we can do to um besides like blatantly going on social media and being like looking to to work with more X genres, like get in touch. Like are there things besides like putting out records in that genre or like maybe writing a song on your own and recording it on your own and putting that out so that you can draw more of that? Like, yeah, that's funny you say that. Um, It's kind of the reason why I'm doing Lewis 
because it's a totally i mean it's not like any of my other bands it's a totally like this dream rock alternative indie thing and uh and i put myself in like took myself out of my comfort zone i'm i'm an sg guy and i humbuckers are the thing and i went with the strat the whole way because i ordered these other guitars and they didn't show up so i just used this strat you know and it made me really think because now I don't have anything to reference. I'm creating a sound that's just not. I can go, oh, it's it's this, so I can just reference that to make sure I'm getting what I want. It's not. It's I'm doing something totally, not totally different. It's a guitar with a mic on it, but a sound that I'm not familiar with and I can't instantly reference. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, doing Lewis, hopefully, you know, when this thing gets released, it's another calling card for what I can do as a producer and engineer and a mixer. Cause I did all of those things. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think it's great to, I was just having a conversation about this. Like when you, it's really easy to just like, kind of, once you find what you're comfortable with and what you feel you're good at or what other mm-hmm. people tell you you're good at, you know, like you're, we're sticking with rock or with metal or whatever. We kind of like get stuck in that, that world. And I think it's really, there's a lot of value in it and intentionally trying to step out of that world, not only to bring more inspiration to the world you're stepping out of, mm-hmm. but uh, it can create more of, um, you know, just opportunities that you would never run into, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or like like attracting different types of musicians that would like to work with you. So I think it's it's really important to like every once in a while to, you know, step out and play a Strat or step out yeah. and try a different genre of music that you've never produced before. And um, cause it's just, it's absolutely, there's no way, first of all, you can't go wrong. You just learn, you just learn more about yourself and you learn more about, um, okay, well maybe I really like this or I really, yeah. I don't like this. So mm-hmm. you, you don't revisit it again or maybe you do. So it's like, yeah, I think it's really valuable and important to do that. And it's really easy to, to forget that, like, to, you know, to get sucked in and just stay in the zone and with mm-hmm. your specific thing for too long. So I think it's really cool that, that you decided to do that. You know, and, yeah. and, and same with engineering. So, like, my engineering setup isn't the same every time. I'll, I'm, I'm tweaking things. I'm searching for things. I'm t- constantly trying to discover. And, uh, you know, at Dave's room, we have this little PM1000. And I know the drums sound great on that thing. I've tried our little Neve, but I can hear the buses. Like, I can hear it's not Class A. So I go down here, and it's smooth, and it's, and it's you know, it it's something I'm familiar with, but it's not always the same mics. It's not always the same pieces. You're like, Hey man, I'm just going to do the, the core of the kit here and I'm going to go other places for the overheads or the rooms. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm constantly different compressors, different EQs just to, Oh, that's cool. I need to remember that. And and that's how you do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's so much fun. I mean, it, Cause it, it can get boring if like you have a template or whatever, like I know so many mixers are like, they swear by starting with a template. And I think there's some, there's a lot of take away from that because it can be faster if like a start, if a starting point, but I feel like it's just fun to, to try different things, you know, like do use a different EQ on the whole mix that mm-hmm. you've never used before oh, just yeah. to force yourself to, you know, step out of that comfort zone and, um, you know, you, you might end up with a completely new sound. Um, yeah. And just like trying different, like I, I just started trying different random mics I would never use on a, on toms, like mm-hmm. just, just try something different. Cause we're so used to like 57 on snare, 421 on top, yeah. whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's just so much fun when you try something out of the blue and it works and it works yeah. and you like it better than what you yeah. were using but then before. You also need a little bit of time to do that. So you have to have a budget and not, not scrambling to get everything. Yeah. To, hey, we need to get 15 songs done today. <laughs> totally. Yeah, totally. <laughs> That's when like, okay, tried and true. Here we go. Uh, but yeah, I, I love doing that. Yeah. Like if you have a little bit of time, Hey, we're going to do drums over the next four days. We're going to experiment. We're going to listen to like different snare drums, different mics on that, uh, different kick drum mics, different kick drums, different room placements, all that stuff. That's what I want to do mm-hmm. when uh, when I come into Dave's room. Like I want to I want to book a day mm-hmm. uh, when you're available, so like we can we're gonna work on some stuff together and just oh, mess absolutely. around. Cause like w- kind of the similar thing I did um, at Sunset. Cause I booked more time than what I needed. Mm-hmm. Cause I only did two songs, but I want to do the same thing. So when we come in with you at Dave's room, 
we'll do two tracks, but I'll book like eight hours or whatever. Yeah. And then we could just really sit and mess around and try mm -hmm. different stuff and just have fun with it. Cause that's yeah. like when you have extra time, it's like, that's what is really fun about engineering to me is like experimentation and mm -hmm. knowing you're, you're not, okay, we have to get a certain amount done. Yeah. So we have to use what we know works yeah. instead of like having that time. And that is just so much fun to me, man. Just being able to. Well, this is like the tried and true thing. Like every, like all the old school guys would say, if you have the time, listen, listen to everything. Listen to that mic, listen to this mic. But that takes time. Yeah. You know, and yeah. if you don't have a budget and time, then you're scrambling. You just go for what exactly what you need to get it done. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for, for coming by the studio and having a chat with me. And um, if anyone wants to check out your work and get in contact, um, where can everyone find you? Yeah, uh, you can do that at uh, paulfigmusic.com or on my Instagram, paulfigmusic. And there's a link tree that takes you to Spotify and Tidal playlists of my work uh to websites to you know video links it's uh it's 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 pretty fun i just learned about this you know you, we got to stay on top of social medias too because they're constantly changing <laughs> yep you gotta get a tiktok <laughs> i i uh, uh yeah i, I refuse <laughs> to do the tiktok well i started one like right when it came out and yeah. then i stopped using it because i I just got bored of it. So now I'm like locked out of the account. But yeah, <laughs> I, yeah I don't care. I don't get it yet. I'm like, what a mess. How am I supposed to sift through? I mean, I don't get it. Uh, it's it's just another it's app like to add. It's just too much. Like it, Facebook and Instagram is already too much. But now there's yeah. like, now you got to be on TikTok and now you got to have blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And it's like, Jesus Christ. I, so I guess much. that's how 100 Gex exploded. They, they created their own little world there. And then that morphed onto the stage and then they pull out their their DJ equipment and their electronic devices and they just do this live thing and kids are loving it. But they're creators. You know, they're not, you know, engineers trying to get paid yeah. to engineer other people's records. Yeah. But cool. Well we'll put uh, I'll put your website in the show notes and yeah. um yeah, everyone go check out Paul's site and Paul's work. And uh thank you again, man, for coming yeah. by. Appreciate Alex, it. Thanks for having me. Of course. Super fun.